Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri. Today I wanted to provide a little insight on the Weiner process. So the Weiner process, some people call it the Weiner process, it's also known as Brownian motion, which gets a little confusing here, um, is used in stochastic differential equations here. So SDEs, which are known as uh, stochastic differential equations, uh, are, are used in something called continuous time here. So why we call this continuous time is that when we think about a standard plot here, and we think about like data points, um, this is what we call uh, discrete because we have a data point at each point here. Now, continuous time, so you think about calculus, you know, continuous and the fact that it's, you know, differentiable at any point in time. Uh, when we go into continuous time, uh, all we're saying is that if you have something like a process here and you take some sort of clip like from here to here, we'll call this from time t to time, I don't know, t plus one, uh, that this is actually going to look like this upward movement here when you zoom in on it. Uh, T is going to be here and T plus one is going to be here. It's going to look like this. There's a actual process inside of the process. And then as you zoom in again, um, between those points, we'll say, I don't know, from time T um, to time, you know, T plus 0.5, so half here. It'll look something like this. So it'll, it might have something crazy in here as well. Now you think about this like stock data, right? If you look at like the stock price on the first of every month, uh, you would have this chart where you have like one point. And then as you zoom into that, um, you end up going into like weekly and we get a little bit more points. And then you go from weekly, you dry, dive down into daily and hourly and minutes and nanoseconds. And you just start diving deeper and deeper. And there's always continuous data coming in. So we think about this as continuous time. There's no discrete piece that we can cut this into. The more pieces we look at, the finer the granularity, there's always going to be more detailed pieces in here. Now, from a trading standpoint or from a finance standpoint, uh, this is critical because you might have a chart that looks like something like this. And I don't know, these are incremented at, I don't know, say hourly intervals. Uh, you might zoom in on this piece there here and this piece might actually look something like, like this. And that, that piece right there bankrupted you. I don't know, it triggered some sort of contract. But these are why we think about these things because we don't really know what's happening between the data points. And so we wanna use stochastic differential equations because it's beautiful and it works amazing in some scenarios. And so this is kind of the framework that we're, we're starting in here. This is where the math happens. This is where like derivative pricing happens a lot of times. But I wanna take this back here and go into the statistical realm here because I am a statistician and that's how I think about the world. I don't think about it like a mathematician. Uh, I wish I did, but I do not. So we're gonna go in and deviate here now into ordinary least squares and other sorts of linear regression in discrete time. And I'm gonna explain a piece here that ties all this together uh, into the Weiner process. Uh, and you can kind of see how the, you know, these stochastic or Edo processes, which we're gonna get into here in a second, all get put together here. So bear with me. OLS is nothing more uh, than simple linear regression here. It's going to be Y of T. So you can use this in time series if you don't have serial correlation. Uh, it's gonna be Y of T is going to be equal to alpha plus beta one X one plus a bunch of terms. I don't know if you, how many you have out to N. So we'll call it N uh, plus epsilon of T. So this is going to be our error term. It's also gonna be called the residual. Now, one of the assumptions for this, so it's uh, multivariate linear regression. I think that's what it's called. Uh, there are four conditions that are typically met for a linear model. Um, again, I believe you have to have five to get blue, which is best linear unbiased estimator, which we're not gonna talk about that. Uh, but one of these assumptions is going to be the fact uh, that your, your uh, residuals here the expected value, which is going to be the average of these, has to be equal to zero. So that's critically important. Keep that in mind. Uh, now when you move on, you say, okay, we have serial correlation. We don't typically use OLS because financial data is serially correlated, meaning today's stock price is probably fairly similar to yesterday's stock price and yesterday's similar to the day before that. Um, we start to move into, I'm gonna call it um, the discrete time frame models. Um, but box Jenkins is one method. I apologize if I, apologize if I misspell this. Um, but this typically leads us into sorts of models called ARIMA models. Um, I call this ARIMA as a very general framework. So I can't stand the industry and the academics that go, oh, it's technically a Ceremax model or it's technically an ARIMA. 
Okay, auto regressive, uh, integrated moving average. Those are the components you can do. I use a lot of what are called Ceremax. So it's a seasonal auto regressive integrated moving average exogenous model here. You can take all these pieces and you can combine them in any way you want and create all kinds of ridiculous names for variations of this. Uh, it's nothing more though than if it's integrated, it means it's going to be differenced because the series was level one integration which just means we need to do a differencing here to make it stationary. So Y of T was not stationary, we differenced it once. So Y of T minus one. So we take today's stock price or today's value minus yesterday's and that is going to give us a different series. Uh, but that's going to give us uh, beta one, X one. Let's say beta two, we'll say we have an AR term. So that's Y of, I don't know, T minus 12. I don't know, we'll throw something in there. This is an AR piece. And you could put a moving average in if you wanted, but I'm not gonna do it here. And you have all these terms out to beta n of, I'm just gonna call it x of n. So it could be an exogenous variable, an autoregressive moving average. But more importantly, we're going to have epsilon of t at the very end, just like the OLS assumption here. Um, one of these assumptions though, when we go into the time series framework is that um, epsilon of t uh, for time series needs to be what we call white noise. So white noise uh, means that again, the epsilon of T, the expected value of that needs to be equal to zero. But also more importantly, we can have no serial correlation. And this just means that the residuals in the model cannot be correlated across time because we should capture those with the AR terms. So like this one, and if we had moving average terms, the exogenous variables, we should take all the time pieces out of it so it should no longer be time dependent, so it should be white noise. Now, white noise uh, is really scientifically just this random thing that happens in nature. So it's a random process, it's white noise. Um, it is, I believe it comes more or less from a normal distribution. So this has more scientific thinking and theory behind it. Um, again, for things like linear regression, you don't actually require the normal distribution to have just an unbiased model here. Uh, but, you know, normal distribution, you think about this now in the sense what we call Brownian motion. And again, this is called uh, the Weiner, Weiner process here, which is what we're talking about today. It's also called the Brownian motion though, because a scientist had a Petri dish or a cup of water or something, and there was a particle in there and he's just sitting there watching it and there's no wind. There's no one screwing with this, you know, Petri dish. And for some reason, this particle, you know, just kind of drifts around in random spots. Now, you know, scientifically there's molecules bouncing around and it's bumping into this, you know, speck of dirt in this Petri dish of water and it moves it around. Um, but this follows a normal distribution. So a Weiner process or Brownian motion is nothing more than tracking something across time. So in this case, we're tracking the speck of dirt. Uh, but if you have time and we have, let's say this normal distribution over here, which is horribly drawn, um, has a mean of zero. I don't know what the variance is. Could be anything. It doesn't have to be standard normal. Standard normal just means the variance is one. Variance can be anything. Uh, it drifts kind of around time, but it always comes back to zero. So it's a scientific process. It's a scientific approach here. This is what a Weiner process is. Okay, just a normal distribution that's being plotted out across time. So we just randomly sample. Now this is also, I think, critical for time series. This is how we view uh, time series in a theoretical standpoint. We just view this in the sense that a time series is nothing more than random sampling from a distribution. It doesn't have to be normal because it doesn't have to be a Brownian motion or Weiner process. Uh, we just, time series are just random samplings from some set of distributions here. This is something which I'm not gonna cover in this video, which is called stationarity. Um, and there's other interesting properties like uh, it can be ergodic, which is a whole other thing. I'm really excited. This is, this is where I like to, I like to go. Uh, but we're not gonna go down the theoretical rabbit hole of this today. I'll put a link above or below on, you know, where you can find more information on some of my videos on stationarity. But a time series is just the realization of drawing from some sort of distribution here. So as I mentioned, it could be a crazy distribution with like three humps, I don't know, trimodal or something. Um, but if you're randomly drawing from this and you're recording this 
in time across time as you're pulling. Um, that's how time series works in a nutshell. We think about this very theoretically. There is some sort of underlying distribution we're randomly pulling from. Now, Brownian motion is nothing more than a really nice property in the sense that this is how things seem to work in nature when we've gotten rid of all of the predictive pieces here. Um, so when we went back to the ARIMA model and the OLS model in discrete time, uh, we like to think about that in the sense that we've gotten rid of all of the easy predictable things and the rest of the unpredictability in our sorts of models here is just going to be caused by nature. So I like to view this very scientifically. I know many people cringe when I talk about this, uh, but that is how I view it. And so for a Weiner process, it needs to be defined by two conditions. Uh, the first one's going to be delta W of T. So when I talked about uh, this is time and there is, you know, this, I don't know, some function, uh, this function is going to be called W. And, you know, delta T is just going to be the difference between two little time points here. So this is like T and T plus one. So the difference between these two is going to be delta WT. And this is going to be equal to epsilon square root delta T. Uh, the second piece is going to be that WT needs to be independent of all past um, time periods. We'll call it T here. So up to T. So it needs to be independent of that. Again, these are going back into just the fundamentals of how we put assumptions in linear regression um, for like OLS. Again, the, the expectation here of epsilon of T, which in this case, we're just going to magically wave our hands and call it W of T, which is the Weiner process, uh, needs to be zero. Um, again, we're also going to require no serial correlation, and that is going to be defined um, with the second condition right here, right? They cannot, the residuals of the Weiner process uh, cannot be serially correlated across time. So in the generalized case of a Weiner process, which I'm not going to get into too many details on here, uh, you'll notice that uh, the expected value, so the mean is going to be equal to UT. So this is a generalized Weiner process. And we typically write this of X of T minus X of zero. And then the variance of this is going to be equal to uh, sigma squared of t here. Now, what I really want to hit on here is just the t piece. So it's time, the variance. Uh, when we looked at this process here, right, we are pulling from a normal distribution. So you would assume that like, you know, the variance should just be whatever the variance is of the function. But t is time. Okay, so when you think about this in a time frame, if we go one step away, so we start here at time zero, let me go one step in. Uh, we can only go one increment, so one draw from that normal distribution. So the variance, again, is going to be very small. Now, if we can go, you know, I don't know, say a thousand or a hundred, so let's say a hundred steps. So we go a hundred steps out, there's a probability that this process, as we add all of these draws and pulls to the random uh, the normal distribution across time here, and of course they're randomly pulled, uh, we can end up with this you know, greater variance. The variance of this is going to be larger because it's going to move across time here. So I think this is just a critical thing to understand. Time is linearly dependent on the variance here. Okay, And it's just because the way we're stacking them. Now, if you were to draw all these and put them into a histogram and not consider time, um, your variance would be your variance, but the variance of the process itself and the fact that the ordering of this matters, so it is a time series, uh, means that it's going to be time dependent. So now where am I going with this, right? What is the conclusion here? Uh, the conclusion is when we use stochastic differential equations, uh, we typically look at things like an Edo process. So you need Edo calculus. You need Edo here. Uh, you need Edo calculus to actually differentiate under these curves because as you zoom in across over time, uh, the shapes are kind of changing with the granularity as you zoom in further and further. And we typically write an Edo process mathematically as dx of t is equal to mu x of t of t dt plus uh, sigma x of t dwt. Now, not getting too fancy here, this is considered what we call drift, uh, and this is called the diffusion portion of this. Now, I want you guys to look at this, though, from a statistician's perspective, not a mathematician's. I know people will cringe, but that's okay. Uh, this is just an equation. This is just math. This is just, just like our uh, linear regression here for OLS, where we had, you know, alpha plus beta 1, x1 plus, you know, all the way out to beta nxn plus 
Epsilon FT. So this is OLS. Um, for ARIMA style models, this is nothing more than um, what we had, which is Y of T minus Y of T minus one is equal to beta one X one plus, you know, could be things like beta K um, of Y of T minus 12 plus, you know, all the way out to your beta N of X of N plus epsilon of T. The thing I want you to realize with this is all of these epsilons are the same thing as WT in stochastic differential equations here, okay? WT, again, is going to be uh, the Weiner process. And as we saw before, the properties of the Weiner process here, so if W of T are the same, so they're similar or the same as epsilon of T in a statistical model in discrete time, okay? So we think about Edo calculus and Edo processes and all this as like this continuous time, high end, high flute and fancy math. Uh, I remember sitting in a math class asking the teacher, I had my hand raised at the back and this math teacher hated me, it was I think math 562 or 26 or something. It's been like a decade. Uh, the teacher hated me though, because I was a kid that's like, I don't understand this. I don't know what we're doing here. Like, I understand statistics far better. I have no idea what's going on. And I remember we had the teacher, I think called him Brownian motion, which is the same as the Weiner process. And he's just canceling stuff out as he's going through the Bloch-Scholes uh, equation going, oh, the expected value is zero. And he's just like crossing them out. And I'm like, isn't this just like the normal distribution? So it just gives you zero. And he just looked at me and was like, gave me some ridiculous answer that made absolutely no sense. I think he was trying to just be mean and nasty and just like spin me in circles and then he moved on and i looked over at the, the guy next to me the other american and he's like i don't know i thought that was i thought that's what it was too um i don't want you to get confused here this is the same thing it comes from a normal distribution the expected value is going to be zero but it has critical properties so we need these properties in this equation from a statistical standpoint here, in the sense that it tells us if the equation is correctly specified. Uh, if we had some other piece here, so WT did not exist, and we, you know, I don't know, quant finance seems to wave their hands a lot and pretend things exist. Uh, we need to test these sorts of things. So thinking about this in a modeling perspective here, right? These are the assumptions that underlie these models and these processes, these have to hold. If WT was not a normal distribution, maybe it's some other sort of distribution and, you know, we don't know the mean of that, or we need to estimate these things out. It gets a little more complicated, but you need to be able to go back, I think, to statistical theory and realize we need to have these properties to ensure uh, that it's random, there's no serial correlation left in these models, and if there is, the model has not been specified correctly here. So I hope the conclusion you guys take from this is just being able to tie these two ideas together of how a statistical model is viewed and why we have an error and a residual on that, which hopefully you've learned in your statistics courses. So when we start to move into stochastic processes um, and we start to throw in a lot of math and things start getting really complicated, I hope we start to step back and look at these as parts and pieces here and realize that that WT at the end here, that Brownian motion, Weiner process, whatever you want to call it, um, that's really the residuals of the model. So anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time. <laughs>